want to pick up where we left off last night, which was, well, the Four Noble Truths, which included the Eightfold Path, which included right concentration. Right concentration was defined as the four jhanas. And the description of the four jhanas starts off secluded from sense desires, secluded from unwholesome states of mind. And this refers to the abandoning of the five hindrances. Uh, the hindrances get mentioned quite a lot. They're mentioned as one of the practices in the fourth establishment of mindfulness. And they show up in the gradual training just before the jhanas. So basically, the abandoning of the hindrances is what we're after when we're generating access concentration. <clears throat> access concentration means you're fully with the object of meditation. And if there are thoughts, they're not pulling you into distraction. Hindrances are distractions. Okay, so the method we're using to abandon the hindrances is generate access concentration. But sometimes these hindrances can be a bit more persistent and we need to address them particularly, not just come back to the breath. So in the second discourse in the long discourses, Dignikaya number two, the Samanya Pala Sutta, we find this paragraph on the hindrances. Having abandoned covetousness for the world, one dwells with a mind free from covetousness. One purifies one's mind from covetousness. So the first hindrance here is given as covetousness. In other places, it's given as the desire for sensual gratification or just simply sense desire. It's the wanting aspect of the mind. Uh, this comes up quite a lot. I mean, you're sitting there meditating and you're like, I wonder what I'm going to have for supper tonight. Or I wonder, yeah, maybe I should uh, get a new blanket. This one's kind of rough. Or, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. Your, your trip to Hawaii, you're planning for after COVID. That's the wanting mind. Sometimes it actually is covetousness, wanting something that somebody else has. But hopefully we've mostly progressed beyond that and it's just simple wanting. The Buddha compares covetousness or sense desire to a bowl of water that has many colored dyes poured into it. And if you look into the bowl, you cannot see your reflection. The, the colored dyes get in the way. In the same way, uh, the wanting mind colors reality. And things just look like they're so good and you just got to have it. And you miss seeing what's really going on, the impermanent, unsatisfactory nature of things. The Buddha also compares sensual desire to being in debt. Suppose a man were to take a loan and apply it to his business and his business were to succeed so that he could pay back his old debts and would have enough money left over to maintain a family. He would reflect on this and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So if you're in debt, you have to keep working. You have to keep paying off the debt. You buy a new car. Uh, it's kind of hard to call up the bank and say, well, you know, I, I really don't want to pay my uh, loan payment this month. So let's just skip a payment. You know, they, they don't like that very much. Uh, house payments, they like that even less. You do that enough and they take it away from you. All right. So, yeah, it's the same with our sense pleasures. No sense pleasure is ultimately satisfying. Every sense pleasure just leads to another desire for another sense pleasure. If you see a wonderful sunset, 
do you think, oh, that's such a great sunset. I never have to see another sunset ever again. No, you're out there the next night looking for another sunset. Or you, you, you eat some delicious ice cream and you think, I never have to eat ice cream again. This is so healthy. Uh, no, you're checking the freezer again the next night to see if there's any left. And so sense desires, they're never ultimately satisfying. They may be temporarily satisfying, but they tend to want more or get it again or whatever. And so it's like being in debt. Luckily, however, the new sub commentary, okay, maybe we should explain that. So for each of the suttas, there is a commentary that was written, let's say five to 800 years after the Buddha's passing, right? It's uh, someone explaining what they think the sutta says. And eventually these commentaries were collected into what we usually are referring to as the commentaries uh, about the fifth century AD. Uh, the most famous one being the Vasudhi Maga. But for each sutta, there are individual commentaries, including for the Samanyapala Sutta we're discuss discussing part of tonight. But then there's a sub-commentary which explains the kind of hard to understand points in the commentary. And then there's the new sub-commentary, which explains the kind of un hard to understand points in the sub-commentary, explaining the un hard to understand points in the commentary, explaining the hard to understand points in the suttas. Yeah? Yeah, right. Anyhow, this stuff exists. And sometimes the commentaries do have useful information and sometimes you're left scratching your head. But this information is actually quite good. It says there are six things to be developed for the abandoning of sensual desire. And they are learning the sign of the unattractive, that is the repulsive nature of the body. Application to meditation on the unattractive. Guarding the doors of the sense faculties. Moderation in eating. And noble friends and noble conversations. May not be the list you are hoping for. Learning the sign of the unattractive, that is the repulsive nature of the body and application to meditation on the unattractive. So at the time of the Buddha, if you had a lot of lust, they would send you to meditate in the charnel grounds. Now, a charnel ground is not like a cemetery. A cemetery is actually a very pleasant place. You know, they keep the grass cut, all the little statues. One of my friends when I was traveling told me, if you can't find a place to sleep, go sleep in a cemetery. Nobody will bother you. And it was good advice. And I actually took that advice one time. So yeah, but a charnel ground, that's really different. If you were rich, then you had a cremation and they burned your body and there was just ash left. But if you were poor, you couldn't afford a cremation. So they took your body to the charnel ground and dumped it for it to be eaten by various creatures and rot and smell and so if you had a lot of lust, they sent you to the charnel ground. You're supposed to sit down in front of a rotting corpse and meditate on the fact that you and the one you're lusting after are going to wind up like that. This is probably not going to be particularly useful in case you're assailed by the hindrance of sensual desire. Okay, one, we don't have any charnel grounds around here. And uh, two, yeah. Not, not so, so much going to work. There's guarding the doors of the sense faculties. What it says is when one sees a sight with the eye, one does not grasp at the signs or secondary characteristics, lest evil, unwholesome states overcome one. So, for example, you're walking down the street and you see something in the window that, oh, yeah. It's one of those and it's on sale 
You know, those things are really fantastic. I mean, if you have one of those, you can, I mean, I mean, you were just walking down the street. That's all that was going on. But your sense faculty happened to light on the one of those on sale and sensual desire arose. Walking down the street would be seeing they have those and keep walking. Uh, when you're walking down the street and you pass a bakery, you notice the bakery always has its door open. Yeah, that's so the smell can come out and grab your nose and drag you in, right? Guarding of the senses doesn't mean you don't smell what's there. You see a bakery coming and hold your nose. It's not that. You see a bakery coming, you exhale deeply. When you get to the door, you inhale deeply, you enjoy the smell and keep walking, right? You're guarding your sense faculties. You don't get caught in what's going on. Moderation in eating. Uh, on most retreats, the only real excitement is food. You know, there's just not much else going on. The breath is not terribly exciting. Uh, yeah, walking meditation. I mean, you're just going back and forth, not terribly exciting. Uh, food though, yeah, that can be a problem because if you indulge too much in food, it leads to you wanting to indulge more in food. So tuning down the amount of eating is a helpful thing on the spiritual path. And noble friends and noble conversations. I'm going to defer talking about that for the moment. As I said, this may not be the list you wanted. I really wish I had a better list to give you. Uh, on that first retreat with Ayakema, when she talked about the hindrances, she prefaced it by saying, pay attention. You may find that one of these hindrances is your hindrance. And yeah, the first one, sensual desire is like, yeah, that's, that's probably me. And yeah, as she read off the rest of them, yep, that first one. So yeah, I really wish I had a better list to give you. So I would have that list. The best thing I can tell you is... If you're trapped in wanting, if you've got sensual desire coming up, you should see that everything is less than perfect. This thing, this person, this idea, whatever it is, it may seem like it's really great, but it's less than perfect. If it's a person, uh, they're less than perfect, you know, uh, Ms. Wright found Mr. Wright a long time ago, and they're not interested in us, right? So, uh, I mean, unless, of course, you're perfect, which, you know, I don't run into many people like that. And whatever it is, it's got its flaws. I mean, maybe it's a really fine piece of art that, you know, you now have to raise your insurance premium for because it costs so much money that if it were to get stolen or lost or whatever, yeah, you, you have to, I mean, there's always something to worry about. So if you're caught in sensual desire, look at the defects in whatever it is you're desiring. That's the best thing I can tell you to do. The second of these hindrances. Having abandoned ill will and hatred, one dwells a benevolent mind, with a benevolent mind sympathetic for the welfare of all beings. One purifies one's mind from ill will and hatred. So this is the not wanting. This is the aversion hindrance. Uh, Sensual desire for the first one is uh, the specific in the general case is wanting. Ill will and hatred is the specific here. And the, the general case is aversion. So the first two hindrances are wanting and not wanting. Uh, sensual desire and aversion. Notice it says, abandoning it, one dwells with a benevolent mind, sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. So it's not enough just to not hate. You should actually be practicing metta for all living beings. 
Buddha compares ill will and hatred to a bowl of water sitting over a fire that's boiling, bubbles, steam. You look into it, you can't see into the depths. It's the same with ill will and hatred. It covers, colors your mind so much you can't really see what's going on. There's also a, something in the commentary that I think is quite helpful. It says that anger and ill will is like picking up hot coals and throwing them at someone. If the other person has any sense, they don't try and catch the hot coals and throw them back. They just jump out of the way. But you're guaranteed to get burned if you're throwing hot coals. All right. So, yeah, ill will and hatred is always going to burn the one who has it. There's a story in the suttas about this Brahmin that comes to see the Buddha. And he's really upset because you see his younger brother had come to see the Buddha a few days before. And the Buddha had uh, corrupted his younger brother and the younger brother had become a monk in the Buddha's dispensation. And so this Brahmin is given the Buddha what for and going on and on. When he finally pauses for a breath, the Buddha says, excuse me, do you ever give a feast? Of course I give a feast. Do you prepare nice foods for the feast? Of course I prepare nice foods for the feast. Well, Brahmin, suppose you were to give a feast and nobody came. To whom would the food belong? Belong to me. Just so, Brahman, I'm not coming to your feast. Well, the Brahmin was so impressed that he too became a monk. And of course, as in all stories, they all became fully awakened. But yeah, if somebody's angry at you, there's no law that says you have to get angry back at them. Of course, if you keep your equanimity, they might get even more upset because you're not getting upset. But uh, you don't have to add to the problem by getting even more angry. The Buddha also compares ill will and hatred to being physically ill. Again, suppose a man were to become sick, afflicted, gravely ill, so that he could not enjoy his food and his strength would decline. After some time, he would recover from that illness and would enjoy his food and regain his bodily strength. He would reflect on this and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So ill will and hatred is like being physically ill. If you're physically ill, you don't feel well. You can't think straight. You're hot. You can't do what you want to do. If you're overcome with ill will and hatred, you don't feel well. You can't think straight. You're hot. You can't do what you want to do. They don't call it ill will for nothing. But luckily, there are six things to do for overcoming ill will and hatred. And they are learning the sign of loving can kindness, application to meditation on loving kindness, reflection on the ownership of action, abundance of wise reflection, noble friends and noble conversations. So learning the sign of loving kindness and application to uh, meditation on loving kindness. So if you're overcome with aversion, you've actually got a very pleasant antidote. Start doing some metta. You don't have to do the metta for the person that you're averse to. Do the metta for somebody. Do it for yourself. Do it for your best friend. Do it for the Dalai Lama. Okay? Just get your mind away from the aversion and into doing the metta. And this is a very helpful thing. So if you're following your breath, yeah, you get distracted. It's aversion. You label it hating, ill will, aversion, whatever. Relax, come back. But if you keep going there, it's like, all right. So drop the attention on the breathing and start doing metta. And do the metta till you think that you're calmed down. And then you can either continue doing metta or go back to the breathing. All right? Metta is a very powerful practice. 
if they were to come to me and say, you can only do one practice, choose, I'd choose metta. Wouldn't even have to think about it. It'll get you quite concentrated. It feels really nice. It leaves you in a really powerful space. If you do it enough and keep your mindfulness up afterwards, yeah, insights can come flowing in. I've had that happen multiple times. Uh, defining dukkha as bummer. Yeah, that showed up on a walk, on a retreat where I was doing lots of metta. You know, I'd gotten concentrated through metta practice and that insight came to me. So there's, yeah, there's lots of possible uses for metta. Uh, tell you a story. In uh, 1975, I got divorced. It was... It was an unpleasant experience. You see, she, yeah, you don't need to know, right? So, uh, 10 years later, I go on this first meditation retreat with Ayakema. And when Ayakema gets to the difficult person, she said, think of your enemy, you know, and give them some flowers or whatever, you know. And I knew who my enemy was. Anybody that had, I didn't want to give her any meta. I didn't want to give her anything positive, but the teacher said to do it. So, all right, you're going to have a little meta. And then the next day I had to do it again and again every day. <clears throat> I really like the meta practice, everything but that little bit of it, but you know, it kind of made sense. You know, it was very reluctant to right, have a little meta. And I came also said, start every meditation with metta. And since I like metta, I started every meditation period with 10 minutes of metta, which meant every day I'm giving my ex-wife some metta. Over the next five years, my attitude towards her changed from, I hate your guts, to, gee, I wish you hadn't done that. And then suddenly I get a letter from her. And in the letter, she apologizes and says, I was wrong. Now, I'm not going to claim that doing metta for her for five years made her write the letter. I have no idea why she wrote the letter. But when the letter arrived, it was over. You know, she was now in the neutral person category. And I had to find a new difficult person. Of course, that's pretty easy. There are plenty of politicians around. So there's a handful right at hand everywhere you go. But yeah, metta is powerful, very powerful. Reflection on the ownership of action. You ever do something when you were angry and upset that wasn't the wisest thing to do? Uh, you can't very well call up the karma gods and say, well, look, I was angry then. Can we just, you know, let this go? It doesn't work like that. When you're in a state of aversion, particularly ill will, hatred, anger. You've put yourself in a powerless place because anything that you do is liable to not be a wise action. So yeah, reflection on the ownership of your actions. You're going to have to deal with what you do while you're angry. Abundance of wise reflection. Pay attention to what anger feels like. It's most unpleasant. All of aversion, I mean, that's an unpleasant state. Why would you want to hang out there? If you discover that's what's going on, then yeah, let it go. If you can't let it go, apply the antidote of metta. See what it feels like. See the drawbacks of being caught in aversion, ill will, hatred. And noble friends and noble conversations, which I am again going to defer for a moment. So, uh, the third hindrance. Having abandoned sloth and torpor, one dwells perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending. One purifies one's mind from sloth and torpor. Sometimes translated as dullness and drowsiness, or laziness and lassitude. 
it's the it's the too little energy. The too little energy may show up as, yeah, it's just too much trouble to meditate. I'm going to skip it. Or it may show up as you sit down to meditate and fall asleep. So it could be mental laziness or it could be physical sleepiness, either one of those. The Buddha compared sloth and torpor to a bowl of water that has weeds and algae growing in it. Uh, again, as you try and look into it, you can't see into the depths. He also gives another simile. Suppose a man were locked up in a prison. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Suppose a man were locked up in a prison. After some time, he would be released from prison, safe and secure with no loss of possessions. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So sloth and torpor is like being in a prison. If you're in prison, well, you just sit there missing out on all the good things of life. If you're overcome with sloth and torpor, <laughs> you may be sitting there, but you're missing out on all the good things of the spiritual life because you're falling asleep when you meditate or you're not even bothering to sit down to meditate because the, the laziness has gotten to you. But guess what? There are six things to do for overcoming sloth and torpor. First is recognizing that overeating is the basis of sloth and torpor. Changing the postures, attention to the perception of light, living in the open air, noble friends and noble conversations. Recognizing that overeating is the basis of sloth and torpor. You know, when you go on a residential retreat, they don't have a meditation period right after you eat. It's not just because we need somebody to wash the dishes. I mean, yeah, that's there, but you're no good at meditating right after you eat. All of your energy is down in your belly, digesting your food. And if you try and meditate, you just fall asleep. You're going to need to, well, digest your food, just like you need to digest before you go do some exercise, right? So uh, the more food you eat, the longer it's going to take to digest it. If you eat too much at every meal while you're on the retreat, you're going to be dealing with sleepiness every sitting. So, yeah, eat less food when you're on retreat. It helps against the first hindrance, sensual desire, and it helps against sloth and torpor. They say you should eat up until just before you're full, a few mouthfuls before you're full. Now, how you tell that, I don't know, but, uh, you know, get smaller bowls. You know, one of the things I would do at the Forest Refuge, instead of getting a regular size plate, I would get a small plate and I could have all the food I could get on that plate, but no seconds. And that worked really well. You know, I just wasn't overeating. Now, I did make an exception if they had corn on the cob or cornbread. Yeah, I was going back for seconds. But, you know, it's just a matter of, yeah, moderation and eating. It's, it's going to be helpful for a couple of hindrances. The good news is if at the beginning of a retreat you feel sleepy, it probably will pass in three days, assuming that the reason you feel sleepy is because you've just been running too hard before the retreat started. We live in a culture that expects 110% out of us all the time. And so you arrive at a retreat and you're, you're tired. And so you sit out and your body goes, I finally stopped. I'm gonna get some sleep and you fall asleep. But most people get caught up in about three days. If you find at the beginning of a retreat that you're just really sleepy when it's time to meditate, go take a nap, okay, and then meditate later. Changing the postures, attention to the perception of light, living in the open air. These are good things to do for combating sleepiness. Uh, if you're sleepy, you can rub your cheeks, you can pinch and pull on your earlobes, 
If you know where the acupressure point is on the side of your head, you can pinch that acupressure point really tight and that'll wake you up for maybe five minutes. Uh, open your eyes, stare at the brightest light you can see. And if all else fails, stand up. If you're standing up with your eyes open, you're not likely to fall asleep. However, if you're doing standing meditation, it's extremely important to flex your knees. If you lock your knees, you'll pass out and that will be uh, much dukkha, right? When you fall over and land on something, right? So flex your knees. And when you're doing standing meditation, you can do mindfulness of breathing, just like usual. You can do metta, just like usual. Or you can put your attention in your feet and notice just the very subtle movements that you're making to keep your balance. When you're standing rock still, you're, you're, there are little tiny movements going on. And that actually is a very good thing to focus on when you're standing. It doesn't give anything about the laziness part. Uh, the, well, I'll meditate tomorrow part. Uh, one thing I found helpful was have inspiring things to read. Maybe you even listen to a Dharma talk before you meditate. Uh, I had a little book of, you know, quotes from various spiritual teachers. I had one that was from the Advaita Vedanta uh, teachings that was, yeah, it was relevant. So just so, and it's sat there right where I was, to meditate. So I'd sit down, I'd read a couple of them. Yeah, I was more inspired. So find something like that, something that you think is uh, inspiring and that can help overcome the laziness. Uh, and then noble friends and noble conversations, which I'm going to defer once again. Having a ban, restlessness and remorse, one dwells at ease within oneself with a peaceful mind. One purifies one's mind from restlessness and remorse. Sometimes you see it translated as restlessness and worry, but the poly actually really means remorse. It's, it's worry about what you've done in the past as opposed to worry about what's gonna happen in the future. The worry about what's going to happen in the future, I'd put under the second hindrance of aversion. You're worrying about the future because you're averse to the what you think might happen or you're averse to the fact you don't have a plan for what's going to happen. Okay, but the thinking about something that happened in the past that you wish wasn't like that, that's remorse. And so I would rather translate it as restlessness and remorse than restlessness and worry. The restlessness can be either physical, you sit down and you just can't get settled, or mental, you sit down and your mind is just all over the place. And sometimes the two are connected. There have been times when I'm meditating and I suddenly find myself getting really distracted. And I, you know, where did this restlessness come from? And I realize that I'm physically uncomfortable and I don't want to feel the discomfort in my body. So I'm doing something else. I'm getting distracted. So yeah, maybe I need to adjust my posture and adjust the posture. And maybe some of the, that restlessness will go away because I'm not so physically uncomfortable anymore. The Buddha compares restlessness and remorse to a bowl of water with a strong wind blowing over the surface that wind will make waves that will prevent you from seeing into the depths. He also compared it to being a slave. Suppose a man were a slave without independence, subservient to others, unable to go where he wants. After some time, he would be released from slavery and gain his independence. He would no longer be subservient to others, but a free man able to go where he wants. He would reflect on this and as a result, we become glad and experience joy. So a slave is always busy doing what the master commands. Go there, do that. Come here, do this, but not what the slave wants to do. 
It's the same thing with restlessness. You can't get your body settled. Your mind is all over the place. You're, you're quite busy, but not doing what you want to do. But luckily, there are six things for overcoming restlessness and remorse. Much learning, interrogation, skill in the Vinaya, associating with senior monks, noble friends and noble conversations. So much learning. Learn the Dharma, you know, read Dharma books, read the suttas. These can be inspiring as well as, yeah, calm your mind about what's going on. Interrogation, ask questions. The Buddha spent a lot of time answering questions. They obviously were an important part of his teachings. So yeah, if you're studying the Dharma and you have a question, ask questions. Skill in the Vinaya. The Vinaya is the rules, the precepts for the monks and nuns. Uh, 211 for the monks and 313 for the nuns or something approximately like that. Uh, but as lay people, we've only got the five precepts. So skill in the precepts. If you're keeping the precepts, uh, yeah, there's not gonna be any remorse because you're gonna be behaving yourself and you're not gonna have done anything to be remorseful about. Keeping the precepts is, well, you do it because this is what works. It's not about if you, if you misbehave, you're going to hell. I mean, you can find that in the suttas, of course. But mostly it's like, this is how life works better. Keep the precepts. Associating with senior monks. Hang out with people that know what's really going on. Learn from them. Use them as someone to look up to and noble friends and co noble conversations, which I'm going to defer once again. The fifth of the hindrances, having abandoned doubt, one dwells as one who has passed beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. One purifies one's mind from doubt. Now the doubt that's spoken about here is skeptical doubt. Uh, the Buddha very definitely didn't want you to believe anything. He said, ehi pasiko, come and see for yourself, right? So don't believe it because the Buddha said it. Don't believe it because some teacher said it. Don't believe it because you read it in an old book. Check it out for yourself. But Doubt can be kind of paralyzing. It might be about the Buddha. Was he really enlightened? The Dharma, is this really the truth? The Sangha, can anybody else make progress on the spiritual path? It can be about the teacher. I mean, this guy's a hippie computer programmer. Does he know anything he's talking about? It could be about the teachings. It could be about yourself. And that's the worst doubt of all. The, I can't do this. It's too hard. Well, yeah, it is hard. If it was easy, we'd all gotten enlightened a long time ago. Yeah, this is, this is hard work, but it is doable. And even if you don't get the full awakening, the journey is a good one. The more you practice, the less dukkha. It just works like that. And so you do the practice. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, no pain, no gain. I mean, yeah, it's worth putting the effort into it because the rewards are so great. The Buddha compared skeptical doubt to a bowl of water that's filled with mud. And yeah, you can't see anything in it if you look into it. He also compared it to being on a perilous desert journey. Suppose a man with wealth and possessions were traveling along a desert road where food was scarce and dangers were many. 
After some time, he would cross over the desert and arrive safely in a village which is safe and free from danger. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So if you're on a perilous desert journey where bandits abound and provisions are scarce, First, you think to go this way, but wait, there's bound to be bandits. Better to go this way, but no, there won't be any water. You do more starting and stopping than actual progressing. It's the same with the spiritual path. I mean, you start out doing Vipassana. Turns out it's a little dry. You know, you want something with a, a little more juice with it. So you switch to Tibetan. I mean, they got, they got all these colorful things. Look at their paintings. Uh, they got horns. Yeah, so you start doing Tibetan practice, but turns out it's a little too Baroque, a little too Catholic, maybe. Uh, Zen, that's where it's got to be. I mean, you know, look at their gardens. They're really cool. And, and, and they got these great stories. So you start doing Zen practice. Turns out they hit you with a stick. Sufi dancing, Sufi dancing. I mean, you're not getting anywhere. You're just dilly dallying. A dilettante meditation practitioner. I've heard it said if you really want to know where a spiritual path leads, you're going to need to follow it for five years. Now, this doesn't mean if you start out on a spiritual path and it just doesn't seem right that you have to stick there for five years. I mean, yeah, move on, find something else. But if you continually find yourself looking for something better, it may not be the path, it may be the seeker. Find something that seems like it's gonna work and follow it to see where it goes. There are six things to be developed for overcoming skeptical doubt. They're very similar for restlessness and remorse. Much learning, interrogation, skill in the Vinaya, resolution, noble friends and noble conversations. So, yeah, the best way to overcome doubt is to examine the path, examine the teachings, learn what's going on, ask questions. There's no such thing as a invalid question. Well, there are. You know, but there are even invalid questions deserve an answer pointing out why they're invalid. So keep the precepts. The easiest thing to test out the path is keep the precepts. Does keeping the precepts make your life better? If it does, hey, there might be something to this. And then resolution. Resolve to follow the path that you've set out on far enough to see where it goes. And noble friends and noble conversations, <coughs> which are antidotes for all of the hindrances. Not exactly antidotes while you're sitting and meditating, but it's something you definitely want to cultivate. There's the story of Ananda, who was the Buddha's attendant, and another monk having a discussion about what was the most important part of the spiritual path. Now, Ananda was uh, a very gregarious and outgoing soul. And so he thought that noble friends and noble conversations were half the spiritual life. And the other monk he was discussing this was the meditation master. And he said that meditation was the most important, of the part, most important part of the path. And so as always happens, they argued back and forth and they go to see the Buddha, salute, sit down to one side. And Ananda says, Venerable Sir, I say that noble friends and noble conversations are half the holy life. And the Buddha replies, do not say so, Ananda. Noble friends and noble conversations are the entire holy life. It's really important to have noble friends with whom you can have noble conversations. People who, when you get lost in your 
greed or aversion go, yeah, you're just lost in greed or yeah, you're in your aversion again. You want friends that will call you on your stuff in a way that is very loving that you can hear and help you deal with these sort of things. When I was in Jack Cornfield's teacher training program, one of the things that we did each time we got together was meet with some other teacher. You know, the Bay Area is full of Dharma teachers and we imported a few from other places as well. One day we went to see Yvonne Rand, who was the Zen teacher who blew the whistle on the sex scandal at San Francisco Zen Center. She, she recently passed away, but she was brilliant and fierce, both. And she was probably the most helpful teacher of any that we visited. The two things that really stuck with me that she said is, one, don't believe your own publicity. And two, you must have friends that will call you on your stuff. And that having friends that will call you on your stuff is absolutely essential. You know, if, if, if everybody's telling you, oh, everything you do is great, everything you do is wonderful. I mean, yeah, that's nice to hear, but you don't grow, you don't learn about your mistakes or anything else. You want people around you that, yeah, are noble friends and can lovingly tell you when you're doing something weird. People with whom you can have noble conversations, discussing the Dharma. Yeah, this is the things that are really helpful for overcoming these five hindrances. So, when one sees that these five hindrances are unabandoned within oneself, one regards that as a debt, as a sickness, as confinement in prison, as slavery, as a desert road. But when one sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within oneself, one regards that as freedom from debt, as good health, as release from prison, as freedom from slavery, as a place of safety. <clears throat> Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, one enters and dwells in the first genre. 